Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone, everywhere, depending on where and when you are tuning in. It is a bright, hot, sunshiny day outside my door. What's it looking like outside your door? Last week, we discussed child brides and how young girls are being sold or being abused, disguised as marriage. Girls as young as seven and eight years old being abused by 30, 40, and sometimes 60 year old pedophiles. Let's just call it what it is. This week, female gen genitalia mutilation or FGM. I, in my research, I discovered there were three different types. Type one is where they cut off the hood. Type two is where they cut off the clitoris and part of the labia. And type three, where they cut off the clitoris and then sew it up sew up the lips so that there's just a little hole for pee and menstrual flow. Some people call this practice barbaric, mutilation. Some call it circumcision. Some parents who have had it done to them by their parents, who had it done to them by their parents, who had it done to their parents, consider this empowering. Protecting these young girls from quote unquote itchiness that would make them sleep around with men when they get older. But, it has been discovered that FGM causes that child to grow into a woman who has no feelings at all, making intercourse very painful, increases in, it, it also increases adultery, and it gives them no power or authority over their own bodies. This week, we have some experts. As a matter of fact, we are joined by a few doctors who are going to talk to us because it's not just happening in Africa. In my studies, I found that it's happening in Australia, it's happening in France, it's happening even here in the United States, because as people travel, they bring their cultural ways with them. So this is a global problem, and we're going to talk about that today. My co-host is on the road, so we will not get our editorial this week, and we won't get to know what national day it is. But I'm going to turn it over to our Madam CEO, Reverend Pam, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Ambassador. Uh, Niasong is on the road, but whenever he, he stops, we want to hear that editorial because nobody does it better than Asong. Okay. Yeah. So he's going he's gonna to take a stop and then do the editorial and continue his travels. You know, I, I am so excited about this program on behalf of Africa Online Media Corporation. I, I, and our board, I would like to especially uh, uh, extend a warm welcome to our beautiful and smart sister, Dr. Mata Taako. Uh, this is her first time on the show. You're very warmly welcome. This is not gonna be her last time. She's gonna become part of this show because uh, as you will find out, when I was communicating with her, uh, she sent me something about breast ironing and we're gonna do that next week as a sequel to this show. Ambassador, this has never heard of breast ironing. Breast so, ironing, no. Yeah, she's mm. in for a, an awakening. Uh, Dr. Santos, you are part of our founding member, so you're not a guest. Dr. Kingsley Ogoji, our chief medical advisor, an amazing, faithful uh, 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 servant. Uh, he's um, an OBGYN and an internal medicine doctor. He's practiced on the continent, in Europe, and in the United States. He has firsthand knowledge of this as a physician and also as an Igbo man, but he's a Cameroonian. I always tell him he's a fake Nigerian. You know, <laughs> he was born and raised in Cameroon, we train him now, Nigerians are benefiting from me, what can I say? So Dr. Ogoji, you're welcome. And Brother Rona, thank you so much. And oh, my beautiful sister, Ambassador Lisa, I know you're on the road. Madam Ambassador, you rock, you are so <laughs> awesome. You know, so yes, and he also again is on the road. So we'll be bringing, we'll be bringing him on as soon as he take a stop. Uh, this topic, just hearing the name, just mm -hmm. makes me want to throw up. And mm -hmm. I was saying last Sunday, my stomach just cringed. And we posted, we didn't know about Dr. Mata before we posted it, but I, I, I am not even going to try to introduce Dr. Mata. I would like for her to take a moment and introduce herself because I really, I, I like for us to brag about our people and I don't want to fall short trying to introduce her. So Dr. Mata, please don't spare anything, brag, you've earned the right. So please introduce yourself. Over to you, Dr. Mata. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so elated to be on a platform of this magnitude. 
My name is Dr. Ta Martha Ako Fontem. I am a female rights activist and an educational psychologist. I am so happy to be here, especially with, to address women's issues because that gives me great pleasure. It is really an, an emotional moment in my family at this, uh, as I'm talking to you because uh, tomorrow marks exactly 18 years after I lost my husband. So this has been a very short time for me and my, my girls, but now we're standing. If he was alive, he would say, go. I know you can do it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for this privilege to talk about women's issues. I feel so elated. Hmm. Yeah, please introduce yourself and uh, uh, let's, uh, on behalf of myself and our organization, please, uh, you know, know that our prayers are with you. We're going to continue to lift up your family. Uh, prior to this show, I didn't know that you lost your husband, so. but um, it is well. Yeah. So just, just take a moment and, and introduce yourself to our audience, please. Well, my name is Dr. Tamata Ako. I am an educational psychologist and a female rights activist. I have been researching on female genital mutilation for more than a decade up to the level of a PhD. And uh, I really have got a lot to say about this because this is a practice that, is, that has really disturbed me a lot. I hear from Manu. And uh, this practice is also done by people from Manu. And it is really something disturbing, especially when it has to do with we, women, especially. I am very disturbed. Anything that affects women affects me as a woman. So I am uh, ready to talk about this today and uh, to also highlight those the effects of this practice, if possible. I'm just happy that Dr. Santos is there to throw more light on that. And uh, I mean, it will be a great platform to, to talk fully on this. Yes. I am so happy, yeah. Uh, awesome. Okay, so uh, Nia Song is not here, Ambassador Lisa. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mata, I know this is your first time on the show. This show is unscripted. So just realize it's unscripted. We don't yeah. we don't believe in going by by scripts. So we have Dr. Goji here. I don't want I don't know if you want to just tell us a little bit about what you you discovered during your your research. What is happening for somebody who doesn't know anything about female yeah, yeah. genital uh, uh, mutilation? Could you tell our audience what that is, and then it, mm -hmm. maybe share a little bit without, of course, any names, just a little bit. I, I'm familiar with Manu because I went to Okoyong. Uh, uh, Okoyong is a village in, in Manu, Manfi, where the first girls' school in Cameroon is a Christian uh, all-girls school. Catholic school is in that, in that uh, village. And it was put there because it's close to Nigeria. So Nigerians also attended. So I am a bit familiar with Manu, but not that practice. And the whole time I was in Okoyong, I never heard anything about it. That tells you that and I'm sure there were girls in my school, maybe some of my classmates or friends, because we had a lot of Bayangi girls who had gone through that practice, but people don't talk about it. So we are doing this show because our motto is to raise awareness about issues that affect Africans and, Af and, and, and Africa, seek solutions to those issues and, and uh, progress. This thing still goes on. You know, so tell us what female genital mutilation is from your uh, uh, standpoint as an uh, educational psychologist. And we have Dr. Oboji here. Like I said, he's an MD and OBGYN and internal medicine practice physician. He will come in from a medical standpoint and also from his experience, you know, growing up in Africa, born and bred in Africa, educated in Africa and uh, um, uh, uh, Europe and the United States. So, and Dr. Santos will also come in. I don't know if from if they do that in his village, but please, this show is unscripted. Let's let's let, let's bring everything to the table. So let's dig in. Let's dig in. Yeah. We have to talk about these things because it's insane and it needs to stop. It's a crime against women. So, Dr. Mata, take a minute and talk about what female genital mutilation is and a few of the things you come across during your 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 research. Then we'll go to. Dr. Goji, Dr. Santos, and then I'll hand over back to Ambassador Lisa. 
Okay. Female genital mutilation, according to WHO, is any procedure, procedure on the female genitalia for non-therapeutic reasons. That's anything you do, whether partially or, or fully cutting off from the female genitalia, genitalia for non-medical reasons is female genital mutilation. Yeah. We have four types of FGM, I call it FGM, because we have other names that we call it female genital cutting, female circumcision. But these names have been, everybody gives his own name, depending on how he sees it. Mm. Yeah, because calling it female circumcision is likening it to male circumcision. Right. But it is not the same thing because this is mutilation of a body part. So there are four types. We have excision, we have clitoridectomy, we have infibulations, and the fourth is any other procedure, any other thing that you do, like nicking, uh, pricking, cauterization, you name them, and the female genitalia. I really want to include things like labia, uh, labia plasty, because those things, anything that you do to the genitalia to deform it is female genital mutilation. So the, this, this issue about the, the name, because some people think that uh, when they call it mutilation, it'll be too harsh. Mm. But it is a bit harsh because it is a body part that is cut off. They give you different reasons for doing that. They give you different reasons, cultural, the cleansing, religious, then we go to religious, then there is no evidence that it is religious. You know, it's ethical, we medics will tell you that it's not. So I have carried out research in the Ejagam area of Cameroon. I have been trying to understand why this practice is done. And uh, they, they, I just understand that we are in a patriarchal society and everything is done, is tailored to suit the man. So these are practices that are done to please Patriarchs, let me put it that way, to control the woman's sexuality, to control her virginity, to reduce her to an object of male gratification. Mm. Those are the things that surround female genital mutilation. If you think of the different types in the Ejagam area, they, they practice clitoridectomy. I know some people say it's excision, but when you listen to the a Jagam circumcised woman called in morning Kim talk about how it is done. You understand that what they do is clitoridectomy. There is excision, which involves the touching of the cutting also of the labia minora. And there is in fact, the most, probably the most dreaded infibulation where you, you clean off the, 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 the clitoris, the labia minora, and then you stitch the labia majora to leave only a, a, a small hole the size of a tweak for the flow of urine and blood. That is Ooh. reducing the woman to, to, to a, I don't, I don't even know what term to use. Mm -hmm. It is femicide. It is femicide to me. Killing yeah. the woman in the woman, that is femicide. Yes. It is like to be femicide. Yes, you, because you want her to just be there for male sexual gratification. She should have no feeling. Imagine you are, you are a woman. Imagine you reduced to, to the size of a tweak, only for urine and blood. So every time, so the woman now dreads even sexual intercourse. Before she has a baby, she has to be tear or put. After right. the baby, so, mm. she so, sexual intercourse is very painful, but the man, this is a beast, does not care how the woman feels. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's a beast. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is something that is really, it, it makes me sometimes feel cold, feel yes. really cold. Yes. Yeah. It makes me feel cold. Mm. All those things who get to me, they give you all kinds of names, uh, whatever term they have used, that is evil behind the practice of female genital mutilation. And it has to stop. Yes. It's high it time. Yes. Our girls have to go to school to be educated, to, to say no. To anyone that touches their body. Yes. Enough is enough. Yes. What are the yeah. reasons for this? Look at the reasons that we've tabled for this practice. All of them are defeated. You want to control a woman's sexuality. Talk to the Ejaga woman and she will tell you that she enjoyed sex. Mm -hmm. no, why do you cut her? Why do you keep cutting her? Why do you keep punishing her? 
it is it is something that I I I feel that it has to do with the, the mindset because I think that they are they are hypnotized sometimes to even believe that oh you have to go to to go through such pain to come and dance or to come and be called a morning king. Dancing. There are other good, there are other good not the other good aspects about the culture. That like the dance, the morning Kim dance, is a beautiful dance that should continue. But other aspects of it, like the ketting, must stop. The fact that girls don't go to school must stop. It must mm. stop. You don't keep women in the house in the fattening room and send the boys to school. It's a rite of passage. Where is it in the Bible from saying it's religious? <laughs> Where is it in the Bible that they say a woman should be circumcised? Even the pharaonic. Uh -huh. That's in called pharaonic circumcision. Where is it in the Bible, in the Quran that is spelled mm -hmm. that the woman should be circumcised? The book of Genesis talks about male circumcision. There's That's no true. mention. And because the man is not happy that the woman is not punished, she has to go through female circumcision so that she can become an he's, 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 uh, it's like it's like a chair in the house that you own that you can manipulate at any time for your own evil intentions. It has to stop. It really has to stop. Women have got enough from this torture. Women have got enough. Yes. And they are still going through a lot because of this. They're going through a lot because we have we have people, we have, we have men and women. This poor, ex, uh, uh, how do I call it? These uh, practitioners, those women who go and get to make money. They have to be, they have to look for other things to do. Yes, yes. Because I know behind all of this is the fact that we live in a patriarchal world where everything is tailored to suit the man. So the woman now can be reduced to anything. It really has to stop. It has to stop. Enough well, is enough. So so Dr. Marco, <laughs> before we go into Dr. Ogoji and Dr. Santo, how did this practice come about? Why, why no. was it that? This started. FGM predates Islam and Christianity. They predate knows origin. But you wow. but we know of stories where uh, let me history says they were found FGM on a uh, Egyptian mummies, and that's why they used to refer to it as pharaonic circumcision. They found FGM among slaves whose masters performed infibulations on them to stop them from becoming pregnant. They found an even among African headers who did that on the female headers to avoid them from being raped. So, so uh, FGM is a practice that no one really knows. The when it began. Yeah, but, but all I know that it predates from the history, from history, it predates Islam and Christianity. But we do know that there is an end date. Dr. Goji, you look like you want to say yeah. something. Thank you, Dr. Martha. Well, 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 um, I will speak from a medical standpoint. Um, I appreciate the passionate and the emotion attached to the yes. colleague. Yes. But um, I want to say that I don't want to repeat some of it. I will not repeat some of the things that she has already said. But however, FGM, the type one, where the cut clitoris is more common in most African countries, like in Igbos, the clear clitoris, and usually done when they are infants. Um, type two, type three, is really done among the Igbos. My type four is most of the time caused by women themselves. Piercing is type four. It's common among American girls. They pierce their genitalia, they put chemicals on their genitalia to make it tight for to men. This is not men problem. So type four is not caused by men. God. Women go and do it themselves with piercing, earrings, sodas to make their vagina tight. Blood of Jesus. All sorts of things they do. These are women grown adult issue, mm -hmm. not a cultural issue, not even common in Africa. It's an American European practice. But then, so those ones is women rights. You have a right to do whatever you do with your body. If an adult girl who is 18 wants to go and pierce her vagina, she can go ahead, no problem. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't I wouldn't classify that as the dangerous FGM because they do it themselves. Yes. That one is no, no. So the two dangerous ones are type two and type three. Type two and type three is the most dangerous. They're all bad, don't get me wrong. Right. 
okay, they're all bad. But type one usually have no long-term complication for gynecological or medical reason. Sexual satisfaction is a relative term. Mm -hmm. In the study that was done many times with a woman with FGM type one, clitoridectomy, with the clitoridectomy, half of the women say there's no difference. Some say, well, that's what that's the, the, is the, have a problem. Again, none of them is right. Again, in Nigeria and Igbo in particular, is performed by women, not men. So right. it is performed, mothers take their daughters to get their clitoris cut off when they're about between the age of one week to two, to two months. Right. Very, very young. And it's performed by unskilled workers, unskilled people. So even when we try to stop it, it has come from the women. That's where the education comes from. We have to be careful. Our women, when they come to America, want to have a baby, it's, oh, you have, you have FGM. They take offense. Because for them, it's normal. Especially the criteria me to say, oh, that's normal. It's my custom. You call it mutilation, some of them will fight you. Hey. So, so you have to be very, very sensitive. When we talk to the patient, say, you know what? You've been, you have a clitoris cut. Maybe a cultural thing is not right. Please don't pass it to the next generation. So this is emotion and part. I'm being practical here. Yes. The lady with small mutilation in the vagina, I have to say, oh, your vagina looks different from those other ladies. She said, how? Oh, so well, there's no clitoris. Oh, my mother took it when I was a baby. Uh, my daughter doesn't have it. Then you can just say, well, your mother may have done that. You may have done that to your first daughter, please. I don't think it's right. Yeah. She stopped. So we have to be very, very practical here. So okay. it's a woman thing performed by women for various reasons. I mean, the reason, the reason the people who support this say it's done for one, if you do circumcision, the woman, will be, the woman will be a virgin before getting married. Chastity. Her fertility will be, her fertility will be preserved too. She'll be marriageable because men don't want, those days our forefathers don't want women with long clitoris because they assume that they'll become more, more promiscuous and go outside. Mm -hmm. So these are things the family do. And finally, other people say, well, um, it, um, it improves hygiene and actually, Again, to support my colleague, enjoy enhances sexual pleasure for their partners. So those are reasons. Culture, virginity, um, make them marry because men would not, some of men will say, if you are so hyperactive, um, you go out and you, you won't be for me alone. And then finally, hygiene, they say, well, hygiene, if it's long and those things are there, it's difficult to clean. Those are some of the reasons they gave. <laughs> not supported. But trust me again, in America, up to the 1930s, they do a lot of clitoratomy. It's done up to the 1930s. Wow. Even done to today. It's done today for lesbians. So will you call a lesbian who wants to be a guy who has a clitoris cut, FGM? No. So that is an adult doing things for themselves. Yes, so that's a, a, adult, a that's person of age making decisions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I need to just say something to Dr. Boji. I don't know, listening to you guys, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, my, it, it's, 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 it's my whole body is just, <laughs> oh my God. It, this is, even to, to know that this thing is still going on and Dr. Goji, you brought a lot of things I didn't know were happening in this country, right. you know, I, 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 but I want to, I want to find out. And, and, and I, I think those women who are performing this, I think the men are behind it. I don't think, I think it's the society, is the culture. I don't think the women, it, they've been brainwashed to think that they, they are doing their daughters a favor. So right. I, I don't want our others to misunderstand what Dr. Goji is saying. Dr. Goji is not saying that women are the perpetrator. No, they may be the ones performing the act, but they are performing the act under instructions from yeah. somebody who is not a woman. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it is because women have always been oppressed. It's not too long ago that we had the rights to vote, but I'm not going there. I'm just saying, those who want to go and mutilate their body and put all kinds of stuff in their body as adults, that's their problem. We're not talking about them. Right. They do whatever they want to do and they suffer the consequences. We're talking about innocent children, innocent babies. I mean, who gives anybody a right to, 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 to mutilate anybody's body? Nobody. Nobody has that right. 
So Dr. Vigil, please clarify for our audience because even though the women are the one performing, if they are performing under pressure or instructions from people who are not women, and I'm not talking about transgender, transgender here, I'm talking about regular men. So let's forget about it in between. As far as I'm concerned, God created Adam and Steve, not Adam and Eve. We're not talking anything we're discussing this show is about- um, Wait, 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 Reverend Pam. I know yeah. you're all passionate and everything, but God created Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Steve. You no, said I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I'm saying that God did not create Adam and Steve. Yes. It's Adam and Eve. So, mm -hmm. but yes, that's what I mean by that. Yeah. So, I'm just saying, whatever we're talking here, women or men, forget about the in betweens, please. We are not interested in your issues. We are talking about God's creation. So, Dr. Okoji, please, we need you need to declare for our audience that the women may be the ones performing this thing, but is because of the culture, because of when the men who are in charge, we know it's a patriarchal society, not just Africa, even here, you know, mostly around the globe. But so I just needed to, to, to mention that before we move to Dr. Santos. This is so annoying. This is, oh my God, I hope I can make it through the show. This is our second time, I think third time having this show, but, but this particular one is really getting to me. This one is really deep. Go ahead, Dr. Ogoji. So to clarify, that's why I said type four is no brainer. Yes. Adult doing for themselves. So we don't talk about part four, type four. Mm -hmm. Type one, two, and three is what we're talking about. Um, it's a cultural thing. Sometimes the fathers who insist they go and do it. Most of the time they will. And other times, even father says, don't do it. I mean, I'm saying from practical post, don't do this. See the mother instead of pushing the clitoris in because it was done to her. So it's education for ourselves. <laughs> For our men and for our mothers. Yes. Trust me, if there are 10 mothers there, the man, the men who are educated will say, five will say, don't touch my daughter. Mm -hmm. Without the man's knowledge, the mother will be pushing the clitoris in to put it in. Why the other women will even sneak without telling the man and go do it, especially for these newborns. So, but let it, me go back to the you know, for the way it's done, which is so painful, especially type. Um, for most other African countries, even Asia and Europe, some part of Europe, between the age of five and 12, these women are taken to a stranger, mm -hmm. their legs tied, their hands restrained, and the pursuit of the pursuit and the clitoris snapped off. Hi. And they use the all sorts of things to stop No painkillers, hmm? no, pain no anesthesia? What no painkillers, no anesthesia. You see, Ooh. age of five. Most people, from what I've read the research said, but in my culture, which is wrong, don't get me wrong, is done as a neonate. So it's, it's not like made position. It is baby, baby's born at 30 days, neonate. So that mm -hmm. is wrong, but that's even more humane than the age of between five and 15. Yes. yes. Take a girl, tie her legs, tie her hands, and the stranger goes to the vagina and then snap up the clitoris and cut off stuff. And then after the procedure, they will be good, they will be silver, they will be food, they will be dance, there will be music, and they will celebrate that she becomes a woman. So she's five. That she's she's, that she's not a woman. <laughs> education on the side of the man and the mother, in particular, because most, most of these kids have no consent. They don't know what's happened to them. So yeah. we can't stop it by putting education on the bomb. So when I say a little female circumcision in my practice, I, I'm very, very, very cultural sensitive. If I raise a topic and she say, oh, that terrible thing, I say, good. I'm sure you won't do that, you do, that, do that to your daughter. When I deliver a female baby for an African descent kid, I will say, do you want circumcision? I'll ask, I'll ask the guys. If you say yes, I say, well, that was a joke. Please, 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 that is not done. It's not done. It's not done. So that's the pursuit. So dangerous. So, possible complication of these things the razor blade, the scissors, the knife are old, rusted, and yes. not sterilized most of the time. So, that's why I see some grown patients come here with hepatitis C, HIV. You begin to think that they got it from somewhere. No, it's from female genital mutilation. Uh, mm, mm, mm. It is for me. So it is dangerous. They do it on sterile environment. 
not trained, got no, in fact, some doctors have been doing it in Africa those days to prevent us people from doing this, but CDC and what has said, please, under no circumstances should a doctor perform it. A mother comes to you, discourage her as much as possible. Again, but if you know the mother is gonna go do it somewhere else and cause infection, you try with, I don't know, we don't have, we don't have child protective to report the mom to. Because whatever, they can go home and go, that's what some doctors those days will actually say, okay, let me do it for you and, do, and snap the picture in a very sterile environment. Again, it is, it's a malpractice. It's, um, it's medical, it's medical. If you do that in this part of the world, your license will be gone. Yes, yes. You know, you're trying to help, you trying to help the woman not to go and seek unskilled medical procedure. Thank you, so, Dr. Oh, Dr. Complications say again, just for gynecology, people with type two, type three, always have problem with sex, yes. painful sex, non enjoyable sex, um, increases of um, STD, HIV, hepatitis, because if that type, if, if the vagina is so mutilated that it's tight, chance of trauma and abrasion and bleeding is there. I want this, and also right here in the genital area, signs of passing infection goes times 100. Aye. Then oh. finally, obstetrics delivery. So women who are pregnant, about to have baby, if they have type two, type three, be ready for postpartum hemorrhage, bleeding after delivery. And most be ready for severe yeah. laceration. Yeah, postpartum bleeding. Because usually vagina is made to dilate and accommodate the baby over the head. Right. After type two, type three, type two, type three, FGM, there is scar around the open vagina. Mm -hmm. It will not dilate. Hey. Some doctors have to actually put a, do an episiotomy. In fact, thinking back, episiotomy is standard for first time mom when I was trained in Africa. Even here, it was standard first time mom. But now in America, we don't do episiotomy unless is really, really indicated. Episiotomy mm -hmm. is cutting the vagina open during delivery to, the baby, to, to deliver the baby's head. Yeah. When I was training, almost every first time mom would, do, would give them episiotomy to release the head. But the teacher says that, do not do that. Most people will come out and there'll be some small tear that can heal with that suturing. Some will heal with suturing. But if a patient has FGM type two, type three, please, please, give her episiotomy because she's gonna rip really bad. Sometimes mm -hmm. you tear from the vagina to the rectum and develop what you call um, vagina rectal fistula and the poops are coming from the vagina. These are problems. Uh, wow, thank oh, you so oh much. Oh my God, oh my God, Dr. Goji, take a break. I, I, I don't yes. know, I, my, 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 my whole body is just, oh Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me. Uh, uh, before we go to Dr. Santos, you know, it is so amazing. But why do you think God put it there? If the woman did not need the clitoris, God would not have put it there. This is, oh my God, this is. You know, woo. before the show, I had an opportunity to look at a YouTube video about a young lady, her name is Khadija. She's from Sierra Leone. She calls herself a Sierra Leone Australian. And she had it done to her. She said she left Sierra Leone. And before she left, her mother took her to see this old woman who had an old little little rusty knife, like Dr. Doji said. Uh, her mother tied her down and held her down. This woman went between her legs, cut her clitoris. And she's like, why did you do that? She said, it was done to me. And that was that. So they moved away. So now she's a grown woman. And she's now teaching and educating women about female genitalia or mutilization until they started talking about the different types. She said her eyes lit on the type two. And she realized, that she teaching and educating other women didn't even realize that that had been done to her until she found out about the different types. She said, then she went home to her mother talking about, why did you do this? She said, you don't know African woman is putting her fingers in her mother's face. Yeah. And her mother had no explanation. So now she's going around teaching and helping other women to not do this to their daughters. I just thought this was so amazing. I discovered some other things in my research, but we want to hear from Dr. Santos while Reverend Pam's body calms down as much as she can. You guys pray for me. Get a, pray, get a breath. Pray, pray, <laughs> I pray think, for me uh, because I, I, I may go, I may, I, may, I may take the wrong exit on this show. You guys really pray for me. Yes, I, yes. I am really furious. I am yes. very, very furious. So and it is evident. I, 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 have, I have to remember that I'm a child of God. I'm a servant and it's of God. evident that this has not been done to you. 
Of course not. Wow. I, I, that, that we don't even do it in my village. Even if they did in my village, my father would never have let anybody touch his daughters, uh -huh. especially me. Don't, don't even know. I, that's why I can't even. I can't phantom it. And I mean, just listening to Doctor Mata and Doctor Gojim, and my body is just. That is, I, I don't even. The English language cannot express what I'm, I'm feeling. You know, the English language cannot. Doctor Doctor Santos, please. Whew, Jesus. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I've been listening, and I know that this is a very uh, horrific, horrible, terrible, and what kind of other terminology I can call, <sighs> especially for our women. And uh, instead of talking here, I think I should do some therapy for the women who are here and all the women who are listening. Please. I'll have, I'll have some Please. deep breath. Take do some muscle relaxation, we'll get a walk around, get a cup of water, and uh, uh, relax, 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 relax. We are trying to fix society. We are trying to fix society. We are not here. We are not here to get an already bad situation worse. We are here to get a worse situation better. And uh, our women. Our women, not only our women, mankind as a whole has been subjected to unorthodox practices in the name of culture. Uh, in the mental health profession, we have, been, we have been forbidden or we have been warned not to consider certain traditions as mental health issues, but that right. will not apply here. This is a mental health issue. Yes. It's typically a mental health issue because uh, we were warned not to diagnose certain traditions uh, traditional practices like uh, when masquerades are dancing in Africa and people are uh, speaking in different tongues, we should not consider that for schizophrenia. Those are the kind of things we we are we are one about to draw a line in our multi in our cross cultural diagnosis, not to um, mimic some symptoms of certain culture and consider them a mental health issue. But this one, whereby you assume responsibility of uh, manipulating uh, somebody's body, especially a woman's body. Are we talking of a woman's body? Uh, meaning that I'm talking of the vagina. Yeah, a woman's body. Um, if you go into it without authorization and you do what you want, especially at the naive age, I mean, without any informed consent, I mean, you are committing a very great crime uh, let alone uh, trying to humiliate that individual to be inferior. And I see why uh, these days uh, women who have been fighting for women's rights have now split between those who are moderate, as Dr. Okuji says, this is carried out by women. There are women who are moderate and there are other women who are taken to the extreme. They are taken to the extreme because of this. Dr. Mata, Dr. Tara Mata falls amongst this class of women who with them is a no-no. They call them, society called them feminists, but it's now I see the reason why some of them have a, a right to be at extreme. And to them, and to an extent that some women will say, uh, I don't want to see any man at all in my life because of what the men have done to them. They have a right. This type of topics give us the right why some women should become feminists. Because if I grow up in a society as a woman where this is being practiced, or if you do this to my daughter without my knowledge, I mean, you will not leave. That's it. Yeah. That's it. No, no. So if I can imagine what the women are going through, and according to studies who have been, which have been carried out, uh, last night I tried to glance at some studies in the UK, psychological studies, and it boils down to children who even went to the UK and came back on vacation uh, in the UK and suffered a fall in, in, in grades, a fall in grades, a fall in uh, uh, social, uh, happened to have been victims of social withdrawal, or to the extent that the teacher said, what is happening with these female girls who have just visited uh, uh, Kenya, Kurdistan, Liberia, Mali, Nigeria, Northern Sudan, Sierra Leone, Somalia, uh, some of them who visited these places came back and before the school psychologist could notice that this withdrawal, this sudden depression, this sudden fall in grades, uh, lower self-esteem, and other psychological threats uh, as a result of these children having been circumcised when they went on vacation. Ah, Jesus. That's what I found in the studies last night. Wow. Oh. 
These are the psychological and some go suicidal, suicidal ideation. Because why should you do this? Why should we? I mean, some people will say it's a, we are speaking from the Western world because this is a clash between culture and, and modernity. Culture yes, and sir. modernity. If we were in our villages, we will not talk this. No, it's a no, no. You don't use all objects to remove a woman's female body without, her, without any informed consent and without any anesthesia then you think that you are doing the right thing. It's a no-no and it has to stop because the consequences, the psychological consequences are way. Wait, wait Dr. Santos, Dr. Dr. Santos, excuse me, let me interrupt you. Like when you know this show is unscripted. Please call it the vagina. Let, let our audience, anybody who's listening, because you say body, they may think it's earrings, they may think ah. it's lips, they may think, please call it what it is. No, I'm serious. This is very, very yeah. important. So that anybody yeah. listening to you know exactly which body part you are talking about. Please, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, the, but the, the, clitor the, the clitoris, the clitoris from the vagina. Um, uh, you know, um, when I went through a couple of studies um, in uh, psychology and mental health, uh, they say anything to do with mutilation is a disorder. Uh, some people practice self-cutting, self-mutilation. If you find anyone cutting self mutilation, you have to report because that is that is a a, a clear sign that that individual wants to kill him or his or herself. Yeah, and um, so but this one now is being caused by people on others. I mean, it can lead to bleeding and to death. Uh, it can lead to certain other kind of um, infections because of the kind of instruments that are used, which are on biological or scientific. And it can, and lack of anesthesia itself, the shock and the pain is what leads to post-traumatic stress disorder. Because any woman who has been a victim to this will remember it some way down the line in life. And once you remember that, you start feeling uh, signs of PSTD, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we have a lot of psychological effects of this practice. And the psychological effects and the risk of health do away any reason that any cultural reason that has been advanced for this practice. And for me, I would just say that from the psychological literature, this is a bad practice and it should be stopped because it has a lot of mental health consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santos. Thank you so much. I I really want to applaud the three of you for yes. addressing this because this these are things that you guys don't even endorse. So it's not easy for you guys to talk about. But if only one child is saved from this show, we have accomplished something. Yes. Uh, and Madam Ambassador, I don't know if you, you see, Salifu is zooming in from Sierra Leone. Yes. And I hear this practice is still prevalent there. But uh, Salifu, you're welcome. Can you unmute yourself and tell us about a female genital mutilation in Sierra Leone? The mic is yours. Salifu, can you hear us? Please. Salifu, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Sorry, my internet um, is too so unstable this evening. What else? I hope you guys are doing. <laughs> yeah, so how are you doing? Fine, did you hear what I said? We're talking about female genital mutilation. Some people try to dilute it and call it circumcision. You know, um, I, I, I we hear it's prevalent in Sierra Leone. We actually have some volunteers that have gone through this. We wanted them to come to the show. We would have actually uh, black out their names and faces, you know, but they didn't feel comfortable. So hopefully next time we talk about this, they'll come. Mm -hmm. But uh, Brasalifu, can you weigh in on female genital mutilation and its practice in Sierra Leone? Well, um, this thing in Sileon, we call it in Sileon, we call it Bondo. That's the local name for it. You call it what? Um, Bondo, B O N V O. Bondo, Bondo. B O N V O, Bondo Society. Hmm. Yeah. So um, originally, um, it was a practice meant to train young girls for their future. Future, in a sense, I mean, 
um, for them to be able to take care of their homes, taking care of the children. That was the main idea, according to um, our traditional people. That was the main idea, wherein they could teach them how to care for their child or children, how to care for their husband, how to care for the home as a way of building up their home. They could teach them a lot of skills like um, garatai dyeing, tailoring, and so on. That was how it started. And that was the essence. But the entire ideal has changed because um, people are now bringing in lots of things because um, some people, there are a lot of spiritual issues coming out from it. And uh, again, um, they say they want to take off the thing that makes the woman um, have um, um, feeling for the opposite sex as a way by which the woman can control themselves. But there has been lots of um, um, things, both medical, spiritual, and uh, physical, even psychological effects, which has um, been affecting a lot of our young girls. You know, and uh, people are so wicked, they could beat them, they could treat them badly, um, wearing... You know, how can you say you are training somebody to go and take care of care for a home and the person is being treated badly? And it, at the end of the day, what they could do before ever they could um, perform the entire, um, way, like saying they've graduated, what they could do is they could put mud on their faces, you know, soil their entire face and their entire being, make them a public laughter, taking them around from one place to another, singing all sorts of music or all sorts of songs. You know, then at the end of the day, what they could do is um, they could buy expensive clothes for them. You see, this has been a practice in this part of Africa, and I think it's also prevalent in other areas. If you go to the province, you could see parents are spending their money. They could come to town, all of their money, their earned money, which they could, um, they could gather from their farming and other activities for which they raise money. They could not use that same money to take their kids to school. They could not use that same money to care for their children. All they could do is they could spend a whole lot of money on that. Thank God for civilization now. Um, you could hardly hear about that in the city. Because before this time, the moment they say those long holidays between the period of August and uh, September, I think they could spend something like a week or two putting them into the shrine, which is called the Bundu um, shrine, wherein they have the, the person whom they call the Soe, um, the priest. They, are, they call it the Soe, who is the chief, who serves as a chief. You know, it's all about just um, wickedness. There is nothing good in it. There is nothing good that can come out of it. It's just about wickedness, you know, um, chopping off their parts, making them a public figure, wearing a public mockery leaving them with lots of psychological effects, um, transferring of spirits religiously, you know, and uh, there was a time we had a deliverance service in our church and uh, one of such was from that. She was giving lots of demons, like seven. She entered with no demon and when she was coming out of it, upon her graduation, she was giving seven demons. Can you imagine that? A single human being carrying seven demons. It was an intense moment for us in church. You see, that is why Africans are to wake up. We are to wake up from such an act. We are to wake up from such slumber because this, is a, this has been a menace that has been eating us up. It has hindered lots of development. It has hindered our young girls that are coming up. It has lowered their prestige, you see, and so on. And uh, I, I am so grateful for programs like these, you know, that are serving as a way of raising awareness to our fellow Africans, telling them that this practice is not good and it is something that must be stopped at once. You know, and there was a time, I think a law was passed that um, no parent should force their kid or children to enter into the Bondo society. If they want to enter into it, then they have to be at the right age and it should be with their consent. Because what some parent could do, when the child is six years old, they could take the child to the Bono Society. What can that child learn? If you say you want to train young girls to be able to care for their own, to be able to care for their family, what can a six-year-old child learn? Right. Nothing. Right? So you see, a law was passed that whoever that is 18 years old, 
can be can make the choice on their own. If I'm 18 years and I'm ready to do it, nobody should force me. My mother should not do it on my behalf. They should not take such a decision for me because they cannot carry my psychological effect. It is only I that can carry that. So a lot of progress has been made so far here in this place. Well, uh, Salifu, thank you so much. And thank you for pressing your way. Yes, uh, thank Amanda, you. Last week, we talked about child bride. That's what we talked about last week. And this, this week, we're talking about female genital mutilation, which is, these are all crimes against females, the, the girl child. And next week, we'll be talking about the breast ironing, which you brought to my attention. I don't know what that is, but I'm mm. sure it's happening not just in Cameroon. Like uh, Salifu is telling us now, they actually call it Bondo Society in Sierra Leone. Let, let me let me say something. You know, it, no, th this is this is to me it's worse than slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, slavery was bad, but I'm just saying this is dehumanization of these kids. You know, by their own parents. At least slavery, it was the the, the 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 oppressors that did that to our people. This one is coming from your own parents. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. They're all evil, but I'm saying this one is, is worse because it's your own parents. You bring a child into this one, you're supposed to protect that child. Father and mother, you're supposed to protect. The child did not choose you to be their parents. Children don't get a chance to choose their parents. When you guys were doing whatever it is you were doing, in wherever you did it, that child was not there. She was a result of your actions. And then you cannot protect that child and look at what Salifu is saying. This child is, I mean, just morally, I mean, destroyed, psychologically destroyed, physically. You know, what, what is that child going to learn? Let me say something to those who are trying to train people. My grandmother, who was a Bamun princess, she had Indian looking hair, very light skin, was brought to the, by the palace at the age of 11 to be trained to become a queen. There was no mutilation. There was no breast ironing. There was none of all that rubbish. She was brought there to learn the culture, the, the, the palace operations in Bali. So what, what are they talking about? How do you teach a child to become a, a mother by, 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 by mutilating them? Her. Yeah, by mutilating her. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. So, so women, women are not supposed to enjoy sex, right? It's just supposed to be the men. I, I, I pray to God that some scientists will come up with some medical procedure to res reserve or implant where they can fix these women. Yeah, uh, I don't know you can weigh in on that. It is being done. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, you. Yes, you know, but uh, so uh, 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 Dr. Mata, you've heard what uh, Salifu has said, he's from Sierra Leone. You know, what do you have to say about what he said? Well, it, it, I don't see it, uh, any difference with what is happening in the Ejagam area. It is also the, the quest for membership to be called oh, the morning team, to belong oh. to this sacred, to this sacred court, whatever, to be looked upon as somebody who is very important in the society. And so mothers who brainwash their daughters that you have to do this, you have to be strong, even when the child is refusing, you have to be strong. You don't want to call you this. Imagine yourself coming out of the fattening room and the whole village is like a public holiday. They are celebrating you. And if you don't do this, if you don't accept, You'll be banished. You can never right. marry from that village. You can never marry a man from the village because it is also used as a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood and an oh. opportunity for the young uh, grooms to pick their brides. So if you, you cannot, no one wants to marry a woman who has not been circumcised. These things, as you were, as uh, Reverend Pam was, was saying, this, the, the, the genesis of all of this is a man because. Everything they have programmed that it should be for their own satisfaction, for their gratification. And so they have involved women in this. This excites us at all. Women who are just hungry and uh, out to, to maybe punish these girls, as I say. Because mm. I have always been saying that I liken this to femicide. You, you do something on someone, you say it is a culture, you say the, uh, the gods of the land are, protect, uh, are protecting you. What type of gods? It even affects our spirituality. What God yeah. wants his own to suffer, his own people to suffer, to die, to bleed and die, to have care and never enjoy sex. I don't, I don't understand. Enjoy 
I don't understand how it's supposed to be for a man's gratification because some of the studies I saw said that it's causing infidelity in the adults because the men are not getting the gratification from the women the women are not getting gratified. So the men are going outside of the marriage to find other women who have not had this done. So this is the education that needs to come out because you think you're preserving your child for the proper marriage, but all you're doing is making her a part of a society where her husband is gonna cheat on her because the man is gonna go outside of his marriage because there is no gratification. He's not getting the, uh, the warmth, the, the uh, everything that a woman brings to that sexual relationship inside that marriage. She's just laying there putting up with this abuse and, and the man is going outside. So there's a double standard somewhere. So. Well, Ambassador Lisa, you, you are saying that from this, this the, the Western part, I know you are uh, African. No, 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 I'm not talking about, from, I'm talking about from African doctors. I, some of the studies I'm, I'm finding from Western doctors, this is what they're saying that they're discovering that the men are going outside of the marriage because the women have no ability to participate. They have no feeling. They have no feeling. Uh, 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 but, but, but they are reaping what they sow. They were, they were thinking that they're going to have a tight vagina, but how can you enjoy sex if the woman is just laying there like a log? So right. if they want to eat their cake and have it too. It, it, it has boomerang on them because they were doing this thinking that they were going to enjoy it. But then, because they turned the girls basically into a sex slave. Those mm -hmm. men that have sex slaves, they get gratified from it. So it, 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 is, it's, it, it is a disease. Yeah, it, that it, it, sex. That's not love. No, it, of course it's not love. They don't marry for love. You know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Santos is itchy to say something. No. Dr. Ogoji. Yeah, Reverend Pam and a uh, fellow uh, panelists. We should know that uh, uh, this thing is being practiced in Africa, mostly, uh, primarily, although it has been exported to Australia uh, because we take, some of us take our culture with us. Okay, but we should know that the African society is typically ruled by a strong cultural class, elite class. And in this elite class are occultists, are occultists. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them, they want to conserve or preserve the most beautiful ladies for them, and they can marry up to 300 of them if they have the energy and the money. And deprive the other ones who have nothing to have nothing. So what they do is, uh, implant some of these barbaric kind of cultural uh, or traditional issues, which uh, have become, which we are, we are out here to say that these things are outdated and we have to start fighting them because we, there's no way we can, uh, we, our societies can evolve with this kind of practices. Have you also heard that some of these societies and some of these cultural courts to whom belong some of these, our elites, do bury, do use virgins, virgins to purify and to get more powers. Virgin, where virgin girls are buried alive uh. in some areas. Oh, That's to tell you the kind of barbaric things that can happen in some of these distant cultures that still keep all these, these things are classified now as human rights abuse. Because if you happen to temper with somebody's body without the consent or without permission, and if you, the father, is participating in doing this to your daughter, it means you are a member of the occultic clan. Yes. Yeah, definitely. You know what you are benefiting. So these are some of the things that have bounced back on them. And when it bounces back on them, they say, oh, men use excuses that we are not getting gratification. We're not getting uh, sexual anxiety. We, we, we're not getting sexual satisfaction because your wife has been, or your spouse, or your new bride has been uh, circumcised. So that gives you now a leeway to go out and getting more and grabbing also from areas that who have not circumcised their own children. Mm -hmm. That's why they can get as many as many wives as they want, you know? Wow. So this is some kind of practices we have to say. It's a no-no. We have to start uh, enlightening those parts that we're carrying out all these and because the effects, the psychological effects outweigh any reason, be it cultural or any kind of uh, superiority reasons that have been advanced. It's more of it, uh, issues that happens with um, uh, members that belong to this cult or sect. That's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos. It is the top of the hour and we are going to play our anthem.
Africans for Africa, written by our very own Reverend Pam. Thank you. Uh, please, Dr. Santos, Dr. Gordy, Dr. Mata, take a sip of water. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Africans from Africa. Africans, Africans from Africa. Africans, Africans from Africa. Africans, Africans from Africa. Africans, Africans from Africa. Africans have many bright ideas. If only you let us share. You really want to know my history? Please come. Sit down, listen to my story. God gave us a wisdom. He guides our footsteps, makes us shine and transform. Hey, as one people with so many cultures, yet indeed we are one. Stand up, Africans. Let's save Africa. Let us all unite behind Africa Online Media Corporation. Stand up, Africans. Let's save Africa. It's time to come together, promote awareness, progress, and solution. Hey, Africans, Africans for Africa. Africans, Africans for Africa. Africans, Africans for Africa. All Africans can rally for a common cause To believe without judgment in what our brother does To identify and resolve our challenges To allow each other's ideas without regard to standards As one people with so many cultures Yes, indeed, we are one Stand up, Africans, for Africa. Let us solve all the problems plaguing our continent. Stand up, Africans, let's save Africa. Let us empower Africans in and out of Africa. Stand up, Africans, for Africa. Africa Online Media Corporation, that's a good way to start. Stand up, Africans, let's save Africa. They have all the resources we need to benefit our society. Oh. for everyone if we believe prosperity for africans if we believe better facilitation for africans if we believe stand up stand up africa is for africa africa online media corporation that's a good way to start stand up Africa, Africa is a cradle of civilization, the motherland. Stand up, Africans, for Africa. We were enslaved not because we were weak, but because of our hospitality. Stand up, Africans, let's see Africa. Jump on the Africa. Jet. Don't be let me Stand up, Africans, for Africa. Together we shall succeed, together we will win. Stand up, Africans, let's see 
Africans on Africa. Sister Rosalind, you're welcome. Um, next week, oh Lord, this is this is too very, much, too much. It's been a very difficult show for me. Very, and I'm and I'm on the road. I'm not even home. So uh, <laughs> none of us are home. <laughs> a lot of us are home. All, all me as long as on the road too, but the show must go on. We've been doing the show for six years. Never missed a show. So, but um, whew. Lord, I, I need help. I need prayers. This is this is not the first time we're doing the show, but this one is getting to me. Yes. Just to imagine that another human being can impact so much pain on another human being. It's, it's unfathomable. So um whew. Anyway. Okay, we're gonna take another break. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I, I won't and I'm trying not to talk much about this, but next week. We're going to be talking about breast ironing. That's something I know nothing Dr. about. Dr. Mato, she's never heard of it. I haven't even heard of it in all of my travels. Dr. Breast breast Dr. Breast, have you heard of it? Wow. This Dr. is going to be an exciting show. Dr. 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 Goji was born and bred in Africa. Dr. Goji, you've not, never heard of breast ironing? No. Wow. Okay, I, I haven't heard of it either. So, Dr. Mata, can you just give us a, a sneak preview of what that means before I continue the announcements? Well, uh, breast ironing, as the word is, refers to ironing of the breast. Ironing with different tools. It could be a hot stone. It could be a stick. And this is done on children who start showing signs of maturity very early because the oh parents are afraid that the child could have uh, to be exposed to sexual harassment and stuff like that. So what they do is, this thing I'm talking about, my own aunt came to my house, saw my daughter, and said, how can she be having breasts so early? The devil is a liar. <laughs> I said, no, 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 let that be. He said, no, that's how we do it. We do that, that the breast will grow, and then it will come at the right time. I said, no, because I gave her this breast so early. I mean. <laughs> It is the what is bad about it is that it is done secretly. It is done by people who are very familiar to the child and, and make the child to understand that it is good for her, for her own good. But the child has serious effects, long term effects, lifelong effects. Of course, of course. Of course. Yeah, we shall be talking about that. It's very important because it is a very disturbing issue. Very, very disturbing. Okay. Well, well, Dr. Well, Martha will be talking well, about that. One long yes. breast and one short breast. So they see a very big girl who has no breast. <laughs> Maybe it was, done, it was done on her when she was just about nine. And she may not even remember. Huh. Wow. Uh, 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 okay. Our our aunts, our cousins, people who are so, I mean, people that you can trust that whatever they are doing is good. It's for mm -hmm. your own good. Mm -hmm. This is going to be an exciting show next week. It, yes, it's um, going to be. Dr. Martha, thank you so much. Like, like everybody, I said, everybody invite somebody. Let's invite people. <laughs> we really want to dig into this because. Can you imagine Dr. Goji has never been heard of it? Not even Dr. Dr. Goji. Hold on, Raz. Hold on, Raz. That, yeah, that is because it is secret, as Dr. Martha said. So you see, <laughs> the females have been abused uh, uh, on the breast and in the vagina. It's like the female are not even super, like God made a mistake, right? Okay, how about ironing of penis? How about, uh, you know? Uh, you yeah, iron the penis. Yeah, iron that penis, sir. The women yes. who want to retaliate by asking <laughs> that our penis is iron. When I went to Guinea Conakry uh, in 2016, that's when I discovered that there was the existence of uh, breast ironing. We can't hear you, Dr. Santos. Your, yeah. your, your voice is breaking. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. I say I, I discovered breast ironing only when I visited Guinea Conakry in 2017. 2017. So this is not even something that's all old. Yes, I, 
Yeah, I discovered there was breast ironing going on in that part of the world because you will see a beautiful lady with no breast. You will say, how come the breast is all fallen? So it's because the breast was ironed when she was young. Wow. Uh, we, wait, wait, we don't want to get all into this because that is not our subject. That's for that's 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 trying to say something, Sister Rosie. Okay. Ross, you find a little girl about, I, about wait, 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 the breast of a woman of a hundred years. Yes, that's yes. Right. You find we don't want to get off topic. Stand naked in front of our friends. She has the breast of a woman of about a hundred. Wow. Okay, next week we are talking next about breast. We don't want to get off Everybody, we're gonna give uh, Rise an opportunity to have her comment. Then I need oh, to. I, I need to make to it. Really yes. Okay, Sister Rosling. Breathing. Yeah. Um, when you do, can they tell us if this is an outcome of missionaries? Because everyone loves their bodies as God has made it. So hopefully they can get us where this is stemmed from. When the missionaries got excited, when they see the women, mm. then that they, I, I, please bring what contributed. I'll hold yeah. that for next week. Well, what you. contributed to this thought? Because people have always thought the women are beautiful the way they are so let me come back to that next week. Uh, okay so they said missionaries that brought us slavery right okay yeah. no but you know what as, as dr as dr martha said when i asked where, where did female genital mutilation started she said it was back before christianity back before islam back during the pharaoh's time so just because we have not heard about it does not mean it does not exist. As exactly. Solomon said, in his country, they call it Bantu society. society. Bondo, Bondo, Bondo. Bondo society. So uh, so we wouldn't even, I know I would, if I heard that, I'd be like, oh, that's a nice club. I would have not known that this is a <laughs> club that's you know, mutilating little girls' uh, genitalia and stuff. But all right, right. Let's get back. we want to get back into the conversation. So I'm going to make my announcement real quick. I'm not part of any club. I'm not part of any club. I'm not going to be club. a part of it. We're yeah. going to get back to our comment. Don't our, our conversation. Our online media corporation life. We don't have any any back rooms here or any irons or any rusted knives. None Jesus of that. Mercy. But uh, anyway, uh, oh we all going to need God. prayer. We all going to need serious prayer by the time the show is over. And I know. So. Tell everybody, please, Ambassador Lisa, invite Dr. Kishon. From the law enforcement, let him come and hear what is happening. Oh, yes, you. okay. But let's get back to the announcement. We already know that next week we're going to yes. address Arnie yes. as our topic. But yes. okay. also, so next also week, uh, okay. also, Africa okay. Online's ongoing fundraiser is Operation Borehole 55. It is our desire to put a borehole in every country on the continent of Africa. Our very first one is already in Sierra Leone, and we are waiting. For the ribbon cutting, it's already in operation. People are already being blessed and using the water. Our next country has been selected. It's going to be Kenya. We've yes. not yet started there, but that is our next country. But we need your help. We can't do this without you. So if you would consider making any type of donation, it does not matter how much the dollar, the rand, the shilling, the pound. All of it is going to go towards our Operation Borehole 55 project. It is an ongoing fundraiser. So anytime you desire, if you want to make a monthly donation, a quarterly donation, a yearly donation, all of it is going to be beneficial. And we so appreciate you. So if that's what you want to do, you desire to make a donation, visit our website at www.africaonlinetv.org. That's africaonlinetv.org. And you will find a link there for Operation Borehole where you can make your donation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Ambassador. Nia, so usually speaks to our French people, but he's not here. Salifu, I want you to take one minute, just one. Well, actually, two minutes. You were, you went to the uh, borehole site. You know, you you had a challenge, but you got you went there. Two uh, please repeat. Can you tell it is? Your voice is crumbling. The voice is crumbling. I know. I, maybe no, I no, I'm, I'm saying that. Can you take two minutes and tell us about your trip to the borehole site and the, the water and the electricity that was put there in Karine? Just two minutes. You don't have to go through all details. Since Ambassador Lisa just announced the, the water and the donation, why should people give to Operation Borehole? You are eyewitness. You went there to the remote area and you saw what Africa Online uh, did with the money that they raised and uh, our sister organization, Africa's Brain Bank, that uh, has boots on the ground like you, you are a volunteer for Africa's Brain Bank, they implement this project on behalf of Africa Online for free. So tell us why people should donate to 
Afrochambaho, Kenya. Sally, oh, thank you, um, Reverend Pam. Whatever money you are donating, I'm talking directly to people who are donating or those who intend in donating. Whatever amounts you are donating, you are actually helping to better the lives of people, especially people who live in remote areas. Imagine a woman who leave um, their house or women who leave their houses as early in the morning to go and fetch water and they could walk for miles to get clean water and in fact the water they could get is not even clean mm -mm. but here it is the projects for which um was implemented by um, africa brain bank for which was sponsored by africa online media corporation it's a it's what we call a blessing to those people these people were never dreaming of it they never plan about it they never for once think that mm -hmm. such thing like that could be given to them Imagine the water they were using, the, the borehole that was there, it was shallow, it could dry up, they have little or no water, even in their clinic, but now they have clean water, and the water is pure, they could use it to um, cook for their laundries, even for the clinic. So the people are so happy and they are so thankful to each and every one of us, and each and every one of you who are the donors, who are donating, and they say, may God continue to bless you more and more. And even the light, not only for water, the two essential things which are very good for anyone is water and that of um, light. And the nurse said, he uh, who brings water brings life, which means all of you who are donating to this particular project, you are bringing life to people. Yeah. So that is why the word of the Lord says, he who brings life, uh, say the word of the Lord brings life and it brings hope to the hopeless. You are actually giving hope to people who think there is no hope for them. Imagine, that's a remote area, a remote village where you could hardly come by or you see a vehicle. All you could see passing by is tricycle or you could see some motorcycle that they are all moving in those areas. You hardly see a vehicle moving in such an area. That's how remote the area can be. And you've helped in actually giving them water and that of light. As we speak to you now, the village, the entire clinic has been electrified with light and there is clean water running from the tap. So thank, thank you, you to all those of you who are donating and those of us who are selling out the program to you who are actually listening now. May God touch you or God support you wherever you are to help us to implement more projects in Africa. Thank you. Th thank, thank you. Thank you, Brother Salifu, and thank you for risking your life going to a remote area that you don't even know about. You've never been there in your life. You even had a car breakdown, but you went, you're a volunteer, you were not paid. So thank you so much. Like you guys heard him say, we have we give, we give both clean running water and electricity to the maternity. So Ambassador Lisa is going to be coordinating the uh, next borehole uh, 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 project. Labor Day weekend, Ambassador Lisa, start getting your team. Yes, I, I, I volunteered all the, the panelists uh, last time when we talked about this to be part of that program. It's Labor Day weekend. We are going to Kenya. At this point, real quick, before we go back on the show, it's our show, so if we want to extend it by 10 or 5 minutes, we will. Uh, uh, if you know a remote uh, healthcare facility, it has to be a remote. We don't want to put water in a city. It needs right. to be a remote area that has a healthcare facility that doesn't have water. Do a video. Make sure you say in that video that the video is being done for Operation Boho 55 for Africa Online Media Corporation. Send us the video, the proof that they don't have water, what they are going through, and send that video and we'll put your facility on the queue. I, I am not going to take any facility to your country because you are, you are from that country, because I know you. You got to send the video. Ambassador Lisa is a Kenyan. We're, we're, I'm Ugandan. A Ugandan, Ugandan. <laughs> we're not putting water in Uganda just because Ambassador Lisa is right. Ugandan. They need to send a video for a remote village healthcare facility there. And just so you guys know, this facility in Sierra Leone, Karine District, it's, uh, it's 6,000 households. So let's say the average household is, is five people. We're talking about 30,000 people are benefiting from this one borehole and the, 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 the engineer did not charge us for the electric, electricity part. 
He said, you guys have already put it. It's, because we, we don't put wells, we put solar powered boreholes. So the solar power that's powering the pump, the, uh, uh, the engineer electrified the maternity. So now the women, the, the nurse can see. Dr. Goji was telling us last time how he stopped his finger before uh, uh, delivering with a lamp. Right, Dr. Goji? So anyway. Yes, in the dark. Yes, I don't want to turn this show into a, 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 a ball thing, but Dr. Goji, can you just speak for one minute to our donors why people should donate to this? Dr. Goji gave us a, a, a huge donation last, last time, and his name is going to be on that list. If you donate $5,000 or more, we will name the ball hole after you. You know, so uh, 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 Dr. Goji, you want to uh, tell people why they should donate to this operation borehole. You believe in it. That's why you're not just donating as an obstetric gynecologist, but I, 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 as a human being, you also donated as an African, as a human being. Just take one minute and tell people why they should donate. And in case you are wondering what Sister Rosalind is doing, she's interpreting what we are saying with sign language. Dr. Goji. Well, as you know, water is life. Um, many healthcare facilities in Africa has no water. Imagine a woman coming to have a baby where there's no water. And in some of these places, you can have 10 deliveries in a day on one delivery bed. So if there's no water, you will transmit people's diseases to other people. Mm -hmm. um, babies will get sick because one of the biggest killer of babies in Africa, especially the first, um, we call it perinatal, um, we call it um, donatal mobility and mortality. So babies, the first one month of life, what kills them and what makes sick is infection, infection, infection. So if we have water there, this amount of baby that die in the first one week of life will first one month of life will reduce. Women will stop having 20 children because some will die from infection. Mm -hmm. The person die in that process. Women also die a lot from infection. The kill the biggest killer of women in Africa while having babies is infection and bleeding. Again, with uh, water you minimize infection to this woman. And finally, uh, just as what, what happened in Sierra Leone, when the borehole is powered by a solar panel, what that means the power generated in that borehole is used only when we are pumping the water. Mm -hmm. And depending on the size of the time, you might pump water once a week, twice a week, or three times a week, or one hour in a day. What that means is that we have power for the facility. In that yes. way, the doctors, the nurses, the patients will all be able to see what they're doing and take care of their patients and these poor people as much as we can. So we we'll call it operation boho, which we'll add operation boho and power because that power can be used for other things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ogoji. It's operation borehole 55 to sink a borehole, a solar powered borehole in each of the 55 nations. However, we have a solar pa uh, power project the, but this engineer just combined it. And the good thing is that he did not charge us for it. Isn't God awesome? Yes, it is. Minimum $2,000 that he just waived. He could have charged us $2,000. But he saw the work we did. And in this remote village, like Sally Fuse, these people were not even expecting anybody to help them. So now, because of that engineer, every, every borehole we put, we're going to electrify the, the maternity. And, and he has agreed. To, to oversee all our solar power boreholes on the continent. Wow. That is Mr. Wow. Thomas. God is so awesome. It's good to obey God. God is so awesome. So Kenya will also have a, a light. So doctors like Dr. Goji who are there, they will not be using candles or lamp to do surgery on women who are having babies. So Ambassador Lisa, I think we can extend the show by five yeah, minutes. Think, right, over to you. Extend, uh, because Dr. Oh. Goji sent me a little note, so we are going to have to extend the show. But oh, before we get back, before we go back to the doctors and hear more, let's hear from uh, Ronald. He has been listening. Yes. And I want to hear your comment. I know you were probably saving them for your last round of the day, but let's share, share with me some of your comments from what you have heard the doctors sharing today. Well, I found the conversation to be very objective, informative, and passionate. Yes, more Let passionate. me be clear first that I don't believe that women or females should be subjected to female mutilation against their will 
are also young girls who do not know any better to make a decision for themselves to be forced to go through that type of complication. But I have learned a lot and I feel as though that um, it should be stopped. I should be stopped. Did you learn anything that you did not know before? Um, pretty much. I had when I had seen this back in the late 1990s on an over program on public television. They pretty much said everything that the doctors said. Okay. So I, I, it was like a reintroduction. Mm -hmm. But yes. Thank you. Uh, it is our desire not only to educate and to inform, but hopefully that you will find passion in some of these subjects that we are talking about because we need each one to teach one and each one to reach one so that we can see an end to these atrocities that are going on in Africa and among the diaspora. We're gonna get back into our conversation. Thank you again, Dr. Martha, Dr. Ogoji and Dr. Santu. Uh, we thank you for your time on this program. Um, I saw some in some of my research, I saw that they, in, the north, in the Northern part of Kenya, there are some doctors that are doing uh, restorative surgery on some of these young girls who have had this uh, mutilization done to them. So can we talk a little bit about uh, what areas have you seen the, the uh, restorative practices being done? I know Dr. Goji has something specific he wants to talk about and we're gonna give him an opportunity to, to share in that uh -huh. area as well. The floor is open. Dr. Uh, Martha, since you're new to our program, we'll let you speak first. Yeah. I know that there are some, uh, I've heard of cases where abroad in the Europe, where uh, girls who have undergone female the genital mutilation and who have got complications. For example, you have you used to have some cases of people with keloids mm -hmm. and for those who have done infibulations, for example, after the stitching, maybe after one or two babies, because when, 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 you have, when you have to have a baby, they have to tear and restitch. Sometimes to even stitch for it to, to come back together is a problem because the skin is already very hard. Yes, yes. So it gives the, it gives the genitalia a very ugly face. Mm. And it makes the woman, it, it affects her. She cannot even get into a relationship. What are you showing a man? So. Sometimes they go for surgeries to try to restore, but sometimes too, it is not easy. It's not easy. Yes. Thank you. To bring it to the regional shape. So when we are gone, undergone clitoridectomy, for example, that's the, the, the clitoral hood has been chopped off. That is not the part that grows. Right. Yeah, even if it has to grow, not grow back to normal to what it was. Yeah. So it gives the thing a very, very funny shape and it really disturbs women. It disturbs. Yes. Yeah. Disturb is a very nice word and a nice way of putting. Just what because they want to belong to a sorority. Yes. They want to belong to a sisterhood. <sighs> mm -hmm. They have to go through all of this to be given a name, just a name. It's terrible. Yes. Dr. Uh, Goji. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Dr. Bernard. Are you hearing me now? Is it better? Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, once the genitalia has been excised, especially the infibulation where you cut off the big lips, the small lip and the clitoris, it leaves scar. There's nothing we can do to fix it apart from just dilatation and um, stretching and things like that. However, infibulation, which is type three, is practiced in two ways. The most common, they just take a suture and close the big lip to the vagina and leave a small hole below for pee and, and menstruation. With or without clitoridotomy, with or without clitoridotomy, though, they may or may not cut off the clitoris. So this is preserved so the woman cannot have sex until she gets married. And when you get married, she will get pregnant without, no doubt. So in Africa and some part of the world, when a woman is pregnant at second trimester, we call what you call defibrillation. D 
deep population whereby you go there, you reopen the big lip again, you just cut it open under anesthesia. If she's lucky, her clitoris will be intact. So you just open the big lip and then there was some scarring, but it's that, that, way, that way she can have a baby without a lot of scarring. Believe it or not, you know, I'm always a devil advocate. Believe it or not, in before 1997, so many African women from East Africa will come here with infibulation, got pregnant, have their baby, they do what they call defibrillation to release the vagina, and will request for re infibulation. Mm. So believe it or not, it happens in this it happens in Africa all the time. Some of them, once baby comes out, they go and close it back for the next time they have baby. Oh, but they want to make sure that their vagina remains that way. Are they doing it from their own mind or to please their husband? I don't know. So, so in the US, so women fought doctors for not doing what to call re infibulation. Hmm. They fought the doctors. So in 1997, US Senate passed a law. Hmm. That is criminal for you to do any medically unnecessary surgery for any young lady less than 18. Mm -hmm. However, if she's above 18 and wants reinfibulation, please do it with an absorbable switch on it. So it's allowed in the US if the woman insists. Because if she wants it, you don't do it to her, she's not gonna find peace. Mm -hmm. That's where the education piece comes into play. So that's only one. So if the inflammation can be fixed by just opening the vagina back, few men go crazy and want to close back after baby comes out. I don't understand. So education, education, education. Okay. Maybe they yes. go home, the husband might deny them. Who knows? That I don't know. But I think you have to learn to take care of you. I tell my people, me number one, me number two, me number three, me number four, me number five, then the children and the wife can come after. You're right. I, I love them, don't get me wrong, but I have to take care of me. Yes. Take care of them. Yes. <laughs> if a young lady comes to the US and have defibrillation, she shouldn't go back for re infibulation, but it's happening here in this country. Oh my God. Happen. So a lot I want to talk about. Yeah. A lot I want to talk about what I call genital stretching, common in Kenya, Uganda, what? Tanzania. What was that you said? Yeah. Labial stretching, labial oh, stretching. stretching. Yeah. So at the age of 12, mothers teaches their daughter every morning to pull their labia. Continue. Some, actually, some actually get a weighted object and attach it to the labia with a hook to pull it down because they want their labia to be elongated. Mm. Or, some people say for mutual satisfaction, some people say just for the man. I do not know. But some people say it's for both of them, some say it's just for the guy. So Tanzania men, I'm sorry if they Tanzania here, yeah. Uganda, but <laughs> they like women with some or they like women with a large and large um, some area, I won't, I won't say blanket, some villages there like women with elongated labia. That the labia is actually Elongated. So they do it intentionally from the age of 12 to 18 by pulling, pulling, pulling. Again, it's a type of FGM done by the women themselves. This is you pulling your labia on instruction or advice that you make you enjoy sex better, but you're only 12. Why not wait for you to get to 18 to decide? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, originated by the men in the society. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogoji. <laughs> Dr. Santos, let's hear from you. When I hear from the MD, I mean, I, it's mind-blowing, you know, because, uh, um, you know, they undergo these operations and all this, and they know what they do in the theater if, when it is medically fit and right. Um, but in this situation, uh, we are talking of things that uh, go to the normal medical procedure. Your voice is great. Like which have been uh, audio, classified. Dr. Santos, your audio is great. Can you hear me? Your his network. His network you, is causing you to break up. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No, your audio. Okay, we can come back to him. Let's go to Doctor. Let's go okay. to Doctor. Ambassador, let's just take the, the last round. Where it's ten for it's five for it. Uh, oh, is it that late? This was a good topic, but we did get off a little bit onto the borehole. 
um, project. That's so why we're we are extending it. We're going to take our last round of the table, and we're going to start with Dr. Martha, uh, who I believe will be our guest for next week uh -huh. for breast ironing. Be mm -hmm. on time, invite somebody. I will be sending that announcement out very soon. So you take that, that announcement and send it out because we want people to hear so that we can help educate. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Martha, your last yeah. word on the subject. I am, I am very excited with the input of uh, Dr. Goji. It's a little bit mention of Ladia elongation. I really want to, to know from the men. When I tell you that this is cruelty, this is exactly what we're talking about. Do you want a long labia or a short one? Or <laughs> you and women. I when you talk imagine. about that, you, you, now when I talk about of brainwashing, <laughs> a woman will go through infibulation, go through de-infibulation and insist that they must stitch her so that she should get to the, the position which she was before she had the baby. So it is just normal for her to be crying every time she has a sexual encounter because, she, the, because it is reduced to the size of a tweak, as he was talking about, only for blood and urine. So every time that she has it, that because she weeps because of pains. So the woman now has been brainwashed to know that she must cry during this process and you must be stitched. Sometimes they even develop keloids. Mm -hmm. That makes it even difficult to stitch the ends, and it gives them a very funny, funny uh, labia minora. Mm. So I'm really lucky that the clitoris is not scraped because there's some, some instances where where the clitoris is scraped off during infibulation, mm. and the labia oh. minora chopped off. Then I want to ask Dr. Gorgi, what about labia plasty? Is this not part of female genital mutilation, where you reduce the labia minora as a medic. Um, I think it should, be, it should be part of it. No, labia plasty, again, remember anything done by adults and adults, okay? If a woman, some women have huge clitoris and they decided they want to be, they want to be, um, um, how do I put it? Decided they want to be, anyway, decided they don't like it. They come and complain, doctor, we cut it off, we call it, that is done. In fact, in the US, they should do it for, for people with, uh, they call it, people with too much erotic lymphomax, lymphomaniacs. They come, they cut it down for them. So I'm come because I can't handle this, I can't get satisfied, I have to cut off my labia. If a woman is 18 and above and requests that you do something on the body, you can do it, just like, breast reduction. So mm -hmm. may have huge breasts that will come and tell you that they have, it causes waist pain, back pain, all sort of things. If for example, psychologically, remember that the psych, may, um, the mental well-being of a human being is as important as the physical well-being. Mm -hmm. If a woman comes to me and say, my labia is too big, I can't stand it. I'm embarrassed <laughs> that my boyfriend say, what is this? I want it cut off. After due counseling and consent, I will take my knife and score it off and give her the rest to take home. Take home. Take it. <laughs> so she's an adult. So the problem is when it's done for teenagers and babies and newborn. Same to breast. I have a lot of pressure. Breast is not too big, they want it big. Other the breast is small, they want it bigger. So how about <laughs> breast enlargement? Is it a problem? So it's choice. Right. An adult can do whatever they do with their body. We'll not talk about those ones. That's why in the US, that law passed in 1997 that if a woman wants infibulation performed on her genitalia and she's above 18, please go ahead and do it and get paid. <laughs> it is also, Thank it, you, it's, also important, it's also important that people should be made to understand that all those, according to the World Health Organization, are classified under female genital mutilation. I agree. Yes. Yes. Let people be aware of that so that when you are pricking, nicking, or cauterizing, you know that you are performing female genital mutilation. We are doing labiaplasty, you are doing the same. If you are doing uh, with the plus, whether, whether it's, uh, I don't know, they have, there's a term that they use, and that has so skipped my memory, because they don't want to call, they don't want to call it. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, the other, the other terms are there. Maybe circumcision, uh, 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 female genital circumcision. Plasty. That is the term. Okay. Cl Clitoroplasty, yeah. yes. Plasty just fixes yes. clitoroplasty, yeah. Thank you. All, the, all of them, all of them fall under female genital mutilation, wow. including labia plasty that medics perform. Thank you, Dr. Martha. We look forward to hearing from you again next week. Dr. Goji, thank you. Dr. Santos, your last word on the subject? Yeah, it's 540. Yeah, yeah. Your last round, this is the last round of the table. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now very well? Yeah. We can hear you, but not very well. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm, so, I'm so grateful. Uh, with uh, the expertise of Dr. Ogoji and Dr. Matt on this topic. And uh, I think uh, I'm so worried about the mental health and well-being of all the victims, because I know that uh, these are issues that are quite troubling to the female population and women. And I know that it's a core uh, practice that uh, uh, at this particular point in time has to be has to be eradicated, has to be eradicated because um, it's really a, a sort of huge abuse to the women and to the girls. Um, and then also those living in the Western world uh, and those who have uh, crossed the age of uh, uh, 18 who can decide on when to, it is to be done with their body, that is no problem. They have a right to go ahead and do so when the one with their body. But I think this, these practices that are forced on the women or on the young girls in some places in Africa subject and has to be classified as a no-no. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Santos. Ronald, your last word on the subject? Yes. Um, as I said before, this subject was very passionate, educational. I'm happy to hear from Dr. Goji and Salafu and Dr. Santos and Dr. Martha. It's very informative, and I will take it and share with other people. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Sister Raj, your last word on the subject. Um, it's a very important, these topics. Um, I agree with Sister um, Lisa. We need to be specific because you start curiosity about something, and people don't understand if it's right or wrong if we don't finish discussing and getting the final thought from the doctors. So for next week, it's a real sensitive signing topic that's not comfortable to sign. <laughs> and some of the signs worldwide are really diverse. So I'm not sure, I'm thinking about if it's appropriate to sign this or get it done in regions with the language. It's real sensitive and you don't wanna sign it wrong because then it, encour it encourages curiosity and the no, worst no, thing no. Do, the devil is introduce curiosity without good leadership am i right i see dr ronald saying yes, yes. Yeah. if they don't know then go ahead and don't know <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Roz. but let me let me, my last words may be a little uh long but when i first went to africa my first conference i did my very first conference was breaking sexual abuse, sexual, de uh, dealing with sexual brokenness. And some of the things I said, because I had never been to Africa, I didn't know that I didn't have, they didn't have the societal freedoms like we have in America. So some of the things I was saying very plainly, my, my Ugandan interpreter was having trouble <laughs> interpreting. <laughs> he was like, you want me to say what? I'm like, just say it, just say it. But then we had an opportunity to sit down. So I want, my last word on the subject is, that we, I wanna to talk to the ministers. I wanna to talk to the ministers who are traveling and who are going into these countries. One, it is very important to understand and to learn the culture of where you are going. Secondly, it is our job not only to come and preach the gospel, but we have to have a holistic approach to the people that we are ministering to. We cannot just come and preach the gospel and what Jesus said and what Jesus did, but we must be able to help educate the people. I told you last week about the multiple protocol. We must make sure that the women understand and know what the multiple uh, protocol is so that they can stop some of these atrocities happening to them and they will stop precipitating these 
atrocities to the generations to come. Thank you all so much. Oh, Reverend Pan, your last word. Yes, yes. Um, uh, on behalf of Africa Online Media. Breathe, breathe, my sister. All of you. I really want to thank all of you, Dr. Mata, uh, Dr. Bucci, mm -hmm. Dr. Santos, uh, everyone here, you know, but I want to say parents protect your children, girls in particular, you know, protect them. Mothers protect your daughters. Forget all this nonsense tradition. We are living in, 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 in industry 4.0, well, actually not 4.0, information, technology, and now we are in the knowledge era. That's what this era is called, knowledge era. So share this information so people, that's what we call it in business. Share it so that people will, will, will become informed about what is happening. Share this Facebook page, share it to every village, protect your children. Women protect each other. All those women associations back home, talk about these things. Let's educate each other and we'll see you next week. Thank next you so week, much. Yes. Bye-bye.